we now, you know, we, we spoke about the science behind the SCD, um, but I wanted to go shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about uh, how we approached uh, the SCD here at Seattle Children. And we've had uh, a fairly active program for a number of years, uh, and the program uh, has been quite uh, successful. Um, and right now I want to go into the details of that program with you. So you'll get a general overview of what we do. Uh, we're going to talk about how we initiate individuals on the SCD uh, and uh, how we assure uh, maintenance uh, of the dietary approach. A key concept that I'm going to talk about is the team approach. And I think this is important in all aspects of medicine, but especially when we talk about dietary therapy. And then we're going to talk about pitfalls and practicality uh, of the SCD. So why do we take a dietary approach? So I'm going to steal a quote from Maimonides. And Maimonides was a childhood uh, hero of mine. And he was an 11th century physician. <laughs> they know me too well. Um, 11th century physician. Um, and he wrote uh, that a physician should not treat the disease, but uh, treat the patient uh, who is suffering from it. And this concept is extremely important because really our central focus needs to be the patient. And um, we need to use all the tools that are at our disposal. And diet gives us a number of tools uh, that we would not have otherwise. It gives us choices. It gives us alternatives. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between these uh, in the upcoming slide. But I think it also drives us closer to the primary cause of inflammatory bile disease, the microbiome. So what does a successful dietary program look like? So over the last number of years, as we've developed our Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center here at Seattle Children's, we've learned a lot. And we've learned what has worked and what doesn't work. And a team approach to healthcare, whether you're dealing with diet uh, or you're dealing with medicine, is essential for the success of our patients. And what that really means is that everybody has a role. Everybody input is important in terms of decision making. Obviously, that includes the patient and family. That includes physician. That includes the dietitian, the social worker, the psychologist, all those individuals uh, who are um, there for the betterment of uh, that child. It also is important that we give patients and families support. And that doesn't only mean the support uh, from uh, the healthcare practitioner, which usually means easy access uh, to us and timely responses, but also community support. Uh, support. Remember, when we talk about dietary change, we're really talking about lifestyle change. And lifestyle change, if any of uh, you have tried, is quite difficult to do. Not impossible, but difficult. And when you have a community behind you, it makes that process so much more easy. Another really important concept, especially as the healthcare practitioners, is really standardizing uh, our uh, disease assessment and making sure that we do the same thing um, each time so that we know where we have been, where we are right now, and we can assess how we've done in the future. That means standardized uh, uh, disease assessment through PCDAI and the Pediatric Ulcerative Colitis Activity Index. It means uh, standardizing the laboratory studies that you get as well as anthropometric measuring uh, and nutritional monitoring. And finally, a very important concept is a clear timeline. To realize how long you need to be on a certain therapy before you say, aha, it's working, or ha ha, we might need to move on to another uh, treatment um, choice. And all of this needs to be wrapped up together and presented uh, to our patients. 
So when are we using the SCD? And this, again, brings us back to the concept of choices versus alternatives. When we talk about choices, these are really patient-driven and family-driven uh, decisions. And usually, it's because of a hesitation to use medication. I think there are a number of important concepts here. One is that you want to validate the concerns of your patients, because these medications do have side effects. Uh, and not only do they have side effects, um, the side effects can be quite scary. Uh, so it's important that you validate. But there's another important point here. You also have to let them know that the worst thing, no worse than the medication, uh, is disease activity. And that you have to let them know that the medication, yes, may have side effects, but those side effects are usually quite rare, uh, and that uh, they're not likely to happen. But if you have chronic disease activity, then you're much more likely to do worse long term. You want them set them up for success long term. And again, as we talked about before, some individuals won't respond to this diet. The other time we think about the SCD is when we talk about alternatives. And this is really disease driven. And interesting enough, we did a survey of about 417 individuals who were on the SCD. And half of the time, individuals went on to the SCD because uh, of that choices, because of hesitation with medication. But the other half went on to the SCD because the medications weren't working for them, uh, or they were working incompletely for them. And uh, these individuals, again, are not responding fully to the medication um, that they've been on and require additional therapy. I had one young lady who actually burnt through uh, azathioprine, uh, side effect of methotrexate, went on to Remicade and then Humira, and actually did well for a number of years on those, but then lost efficacy, uh, and then um, didn't respond to Simzia, and then we went to an off-label medication, and she actually responded partially to that. Uh, but she still had uh, disease activity, elevated inflammatory markers. So then we decided to utilize the SCD, and she went into remission, and has maintained remission since. So sometimes it can just give you another uh, alternative in terms of therapy. And as uh, discussed earlier with the question, we use it in two areas. We use it for the induction of remission, and we also use it uh, for maintenance of remission. And the two are not necessarily linked. Um, many times we'll bring people into remission with EEN or steroids, uh, and then go to SCD. Um, sometimes we initiate SCD, and it improves the patient outcome, but they decide, you know what, this isn't necessarily right for me, and I want to go to medication. So you can utilize the diet in many different ways. Um, and sometimes some individuals utilize it both for induction of remission and going uh, and maintenance as well. The next question is, who should use the SCD? What is our patient selection process? And this is hard because this is something that um, hasn't been necessarily standardized, uh, but it's important to think about before you move forward with the SCD. We look at a number of factors. We look at disease severity. We look at disease type. We look at the nutritional status of the individual. And then finally, we look at patient and family commitment, uh, as well as the timing of initiation of the SCD. So in terms of disease severity, we'll use our PCDAI and our PUCAI score to help us. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these scores uh, soon. But if an individual is on the milder, moderate side, then we feel like induction with the SCD is appropriate. If they're on the moderate to severe side, um, then we try to talk about other uh, treatment uh, options to induce remission, uh, and then, if they want, go on to the SCD. 
In terms of uh, disease type, we see that this works quite well for inflammatory processes. Um, we actually have not um, trialed this on fistulizing disease, uh, obviously not on abscesses or stricturing disease as well as a primary therapy, uh, primarily because these individuals have a higher risk of surgical intervention, uh, and we want to make sure that these individuals stay in remission uh, and don't uh, go to surgery uh, as best we can. Finally, nutritional, or next is nutritional status. If an individual is malnourished, or if the individual is not gaining but is in the midst of puberty, uh, we try to find an alternative therapy. For Crohn's disease, this is when EEN is a wonderful choice uh, because we know with EEN that it not only heals the bowels quite well, uh, but we know that weight and height velocity increases substantially with EEN. And then patient and family commitment. Um, we don't ever say to a family, obviously, oh, you're, you're really nice, but you're just not committed enough. That, don't think that would be appropriate. But actually, it's a self-selection process. So we try to go into everything eyes wide open. And if uh, you go into it and you talk about it and they get a realization of the amount of time and energy it takes and they say, you know, this is not necessarily the right thing for me, then you respect that. But if they say, wow, I really think I can do this, uh, then you go ahead. Um, patient selection is usually self-selection uh, on their part. Timing does play a role, too, because we know that a lot of individuals get diagnosed uh, right uh, in the senior year of college, right before they're going off uh, to college. So we try not to initiate uh, a therapy that might be hard to maintain or actually hard to begin uh, during that transition period. Um, so we talk about all of these things uh, when we talk about uh, patient selection. And it's important for us to remember the true goal of dietary intervention. The true goal is not to be on a dietary intervention, uh, or the true goal is not to avoid medication. The real goal is really getting an individual into clinical remission, making sure that they are doing well and that their inflammatory markers normalize. And again, we use the Pediatric Crohn's Disease Activity Index and the Pediatric Ulcerative Colitis Index uh, to really standardize the, uh, our <coughs> assessment and uh, treatment for individuals. And I don't know if you were able to pick one up, uh, but we actually put out our dictation template. So over the last, I think, five years, uh, we've standardized the way we dictate uh, our notes for individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease. And the reason we do that is to make sure that we ourselves know what has happened in the past and what's currently going on and what we expect to occur in the future, um, but also if we're not here and one of our colleagues takes over for us for a day or a week, um, to make sure there is that continuity of care for those individuals. <coughs> and to go a little bit into detail with uh, our disease assessment, the PCDAI and the PUKAI score, um, this is actually the abbreviated PCDAI, uh, which is what we use as opposed to the full PCDAI, and they're very comparable, uh, but the abbreviated one is a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, so it looks at a number of factors or symptoms uh, of patients who have IBD. Uh, for Crohn's disease, we have abdominal pain, general well-being, <coughs> stools per day, abdominal tenderness on exam, perirectal disease, weight, as well as extraintestinal manifestations. And each of these are scored 0 to 10, with a total range between 0 and 70. And this allows us to really track how individuals are doing. The PUKAI score is the same thing, but validated for ulcerative colitis. We look at abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, stool consistency, number of stools in a 24-hour period, uh, nocturnal stools, and activity level. 
And all of these are between 0 and 10, except for rectal bleeding, which is obviously much more important uh, as a um, concern for active disease. And that's 0 to 30. And number of stools per 24-hour period is 0 to 15. And you range it between 0 and 85. Below 10 for both of these scores are in remission. Um, between 10 and 30 for Crohn's and 35 for ulcerative colitis uh, is um, mild disease. Uh, and above uh, 30 for Crohn's is moderate severe. And um, between 35 and 65 is moderate for UC. And above 85 is severe. And again, these can be very helpful. Standardizing our approach and our assessments, I think, um, gives better care to our patients. We also have standardized the labs, and these are all labs that you are all familiar with. Uh, the sedimentation rate, the CRP, obviously both uh, suggest active disease. But it's also important to remember that it's not only disease. I think sometimes we move too quickly on these numbers, uh, but obviously infection. And sometimes you get infections and you're not necessarily symptomatic, um, and that can affect your uh, inflammatory markers. Uh, the other uh, area is obesity, especially with UC. We've had a number of patients who've had UC and were uh, moderately obese, and that actually is a predictor of cardiovascular disease uh, and not necessarily um, their IBD. And we usually will follow that up with a colonoscopy to really assess disease activity. Um, and it's also important to remember that they're not necessarily elevated for all patients. Sedimentation rate is notably uh, peaks less rapidly and resolves more slowly. And all of these labs uh, are influenced by the laboratory you get them in, uh, but the uh, sed rate is also affected by gender and anemia. So one of the things that we've had issues with is when we get an outside uh, referral and we get the inflammatory <laughs> markers and we don't necessarily look at the uh, reference range, and you can be uh, sometimes fooled at um, thinking that there's inflammation while there's not. The stool calprotectin is another useful test, and we don't get this as often, but we do get this, especially in those who are on dietary therapy. Actually, if I looked at our practice, I think we evaluate those on dietary therapy much more closely than those who are not, uh, just because it's such a, a, a new um, treatment option within uh, the medical system. And uh, stool calprotectin can be uh, quite helpful. It's found in neutrophils. It actually, uh, it's a molecule that uh, uh, induces optoptosis in uh, bacteria, and it's an indirect measure of inflammation. The positive is, is that the stools are stable for about five days. So as opposed to the infectious workup that we often get, which needs to come in within two hours usually, uh, this can stay in the fridge overnight. Cutoff levels also depend on labs. Uh, and the other really important thing to remember about uh, stool calprotectin is that there's limitations when you deal with ileal disease. Uh, there's, uh, we actually had an individual who was known Crohn's, was symptomatic. Calprotectin was not that elevated. And we scoped her, and she had fairly uh, significant ileal disease. Um, so it's just important to remember that when you uh, are dealing uh, with the calprotectin. And there's actually a recent study out of the Scandinavian Journal of Gastro uh, referencing this. The other really important part of having a program that utilizes the SCD is really starting to talk about it even before the patient is thinking about it. Because it's a lifestyle change, and lifestyle changes don't happen overnight. So you can take a medication um, overnight. You can not have it one day and just start it up the next day. It's not a big shift. But a lifestyle change, a dietary change, takes a fair amount of education. Uh, and so after a diagnosis, we usually talk about all the different treatment options. And this actually includes the SCD as well. Uh, we make sure that families have literature, resources, and very importantly, we make sure that they, if they are interested, have a community to outreach to. 
it's important for them to understand the commitment, food preparation, and resources prior to actually wanting to do uh, a dietary intervention. And there are many resources out there. Um, there are a number of websites and obviously a number of books that talk about the SCD. I want to focus in on community again, because I think that's been one of the reasons that we've been so successful here at Children's. And I think now we have over 50. I'm going to look at Kim. Over 50? Oh, no, I'm told higher than 50. Uh, feel like a game show, maybe. <laughs> Sick, no. So we have a lot of individuals who are on the SCD, and, and I see a lot, Dr. Wabe, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Giefer, we all support the SCD. Um, but having uh, individuals outside of the medical system is going to be really important uh, as well, because having an SCD community, meaning other individuals, other families who have done this, gives resources to these individuals knowledge, experience, and probably even more importantly, hope. When you see somebody else doing it and being successful, uh, then it makes that initial process much more successful. The SCD is quite difficult, at least initially. I think as time goes on, and we've had individuals who are on it, I think five plus years now, um, that it becomes a way of life. So it's really that beginning part that we're, we're talking about. And you see a picture here. This is Camp Oasis. And this is a camp that, that we uh, volunteer at. It. And Dr. Uma Prashardi, who's in the audience too, right up there, also volunteers. She's coming from Swedish. Um, and it's important. Having this camp is important because for individuals who have IBD, knowing somebody uh, else who has IBD uh, makes it a lot easier to deal with. Not only that, but this camp actually is probably the first camp uh, that actually supports SCD. Last year, we had 20 individuals who were on the SCD diet. I think this year it's uh, about 30. And they actually support the individuals and uh, have a chef make SCD-specific foods. Uh, so these individuals who are on the SCD feel a part of a community uh, and uh, feel that what they're doing um, is not only helping them, but doesn't stigmatize them as well. So then we talk about beginning the SCD. And it's important when we begin the SCD, even if the patient calls you up on the phone and says, OK, I'm, I'm going to start the SCD, uh, that you see them in clinic because you want to still have that conversation. You also want to make sure that you get baseline information. Again, the, anthrop um, the validated uh, activity indexes, the anthropometrics, the laboratory studies, um, because you want to know if it's truly working for an individual. When we meet with them, we talk about the stages of the diet. Uh, and again, stages um, of the diet are a relatively newer addition to the SCD, and I say newer meaning that uh, um, it wasn't brought up uh, when the initial SCD was made up. Um, but we also want to talk about the potential hurdles, and we want the input of uh, all the team members. Um, the other thing that we talk about at this initial visit is that some individuals get this initial discomfort in their stomach. Uh, not necessarily pain, and they all describe it that it's different from their IBD. Uh, and we don't know necessarily what this is. Some people feel like it's a hunger pains. Other might feel that uh, it's kind of the bad bacteria dying off. Um, but it's a fairly consistent finding over that first uh, one to two weeks. So stage one, the dietary introduction. Uh, this is the hardest part of the SCD. Uh, this is where the diet is probably limited uh, the most. And this ranges from individual to individual. Some individuals speed through this uh, quite quickly. Uh, but we try not to prolong it, especially because of uh, concerns for weight issue. Uh, so it's usually uh, one to two weeks. Um, it's made up of broth, applesauce, SCD cultured yogurt and yogurt smoothies, di uh, diluted fruit juices, mock meat patties, uh, and eggs. Um, and I've been told by um, resourceful individuals that eggs are very 
versatile ingredient and you can make a lot of different things with them. And then we talk about a more maintenance stage and that's when we start e uh, adding in foods in a stepwise fashion, uh, usually every one to two days. Uh, and uh, Kim Brawley is going to go into this much more, but the allowed foods are the fruits, the meats, the nuts, um, the sweetener, just honey, not allowed grains, starchy vegetables like potatoes, milk, some beans, sugar. And again, looking at the question of preservatives and emulsifiers and additives, those are all excluded on the diet. And we follow up with them. We follow up at very regular interview, intervals. And this is very important. Uh, and it's important for a number of reasons. But obviously, we want our patients to do well. Initially, we'll, at about the two-week follow-up, there will be some mild improvement in clinical symptoms. Uh, we'll see sometimes some improvement in laboratory studies. And we always see, no, I shouldn't say always. Most of the time, we see some weight loss at two weeks. That weight will gain. Uh, and we usually will allow uh, about 1% uh, to 2% uh, of the body weight, um, because we do know that usually uh, that will bump back up. If there's concerns for significant weight loss or clinical worsening, uh, we talk about alternative therapies at this point. And again, we usually know um, most by two weeks, whether or not this is something that a family is ready for. This is from uh, our initial study. Uh, this looked at uh, the weights over that 12-week uh, period. And the vast majority of individuals gained weight um, between about 4 to 83.6 grams. That 83.6 grams, he really liked the diet. Um, <laughs> But there were some individuals who lost weight. There were three individuals. One of those individuals dropped out at two weeks, but two of those individuals continued. And that's one of the really important reasons why there needs to be close follow-up, um, especially not only with the physician, but also the dietitian, because we need to make sure that these individuals thrive. Um, a diet is only good uh, if it not only works, but if the individual is also thriving on it. We follow up at about four and then at eight weeks. Uh, usually by this time, we'll see uh, a lot of individuals going into clinical remission. It's also important to realize that being on the SCD changes your bowel habits. Um, there are some individuals who constipate, but that's usually um, a very small number of individuals. The majority of individuals are going to have about three, sometimes even four, kind of mashed potato stools per day, and that's usually related to uh, the amount of fiber in the diet. We oftentimes see normalization of inflammatory markers uh, at the four or the eight week uh, follow up. And during these visits, we ask what seems to be working. We problem solve uh, any diet or nutrition issues. And we really talk about um, diet diversity. Uh, because just because you are on a healthy anti-inflammatory diet, it doesn't mean that you're eating the right foods. Um, and there have been individuals who have really eaten just one food and one food alone. Um, and yes, that individual did go into clinical remission, but uh, that individual also had a fair amount of abdominal discomfort uh, because of the amount of fructose uh, she was eating. So it's important to really talk about, to know what they're eating, and to talk about food diversity. Clinical follow-up at week 12, uh, usually by this time things are, are rolling along and doing well. And we really want to emphasize uh, um, good follow-up. Uh, because if somebody is feeling good, and this is true with medication as well as diet, sometimes there's a lapse in follow-up. Uh, and really, as healthcare practitioners, our goal is to make sure that some indiv or individuals do well long-term. And follow-up um, is an important component of that. We, again, track activity indexes, anthropometrics, and labs. The other thing we start to talk about at week 12 uh, is the question of food reintroduction. Uh, and this is a little bit controversial. This is not necessarily something that is kind of standard 
practice in the SCD world. There are some people who absolutely feel fine by it. There are other individuals who feel like that's a little bit of hearsay. Um, but we have a practice that does this primarily because we are also dealing with children. And children um, who have to do a very restrictive diet um, sometimes are not happy. And sometimes they want to see what else they can eat. Now, if they're happy and they want to stay on it, phenomenal. There's no issues with that. Um, but if they're interested in food reintroduction, we do that as well. So what food introduction is, is bringing in illegal foods. Um, at, we usually wait about three to six months after a patient has been clinically asymptomatic and in remission. We'll always get baseline labs uh, prior to adding any foods. And then we'll add a food. And we try to add at least three portions per week. And then we'll check those labs, especially the calprotectin. Interestingly enough, majority of individuals usually stay asymptomatic when you add the foods. Um, but um, what we see is that some people actually have changes in their inflammatory markers. We've added a number of foods for different individuals, and we talk to them about what they want to add. We've added in rice, oats, cocoa powder, nibs, potatoes, chickpeas, quinoa. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, different individuals seem to respond differently to different foods. Again, showing that this disease, this um, uh, disorder, is not necessarily exactly the same from individual to individual. So some individuals have been able to add all of these. Other individuals, we try to add one thing, and it's a no-go. Um, and some individuals can add a few items, uh, but not more. And so it really is patient-specific, and doing it in a stepwise manner is really important. And so we've looked at our practice again uh, past that first uh, retrospective study. And, and again, we have over 60 individuals uh, now. And we've seen and learned a lot from our practice. Um, what we've learned is that the vast majority of individuals do quite well on the diet, but not everybody. Uh, and you can see on the top graph here, this is Crohn's. There are individuals who don't, don't get into clinical remission, a lot of individuals who do. With ulcerative colitis, uh, we don't have as big of an N, um, but it does seem that in UC it's a little bit uh, trickier. This is six individuals, and uh, two of them uh, did not uh, uh, do well on the diet. So percentage-wise, it seems a little bit more difficult in UC. And this is a really busy slide, a lot of dots. <laughs> so um, again, but it emphasizes that we do see, for the vast majority, improvement in inflammatory markers, but again, not for everybody. So we also wanted to see if what we were seeing here at Children's was um, representative of what occurred outside of our hospital. And so we did this uh, uh, survey, this internet survey, uh, of individuals who had IBD and uh, went on to the SCD. And what we saw here is that prior to the diet, a lot of individuals um, had active symptoms. And then by two months, um, a lot of those symptoms went away for a lot of individuals. And this is percentage or proportion of respondents. And then that uh, continued to improve over uh, the six and uh, 12 month uh, period. When we asked these individuals when did they feel they went into clinical remission, um, if they went into clinical remission, majority of them said um, before three months, about 17% said um, by two weeks. Uh, another, I think, 20% said between um, two and uh, four weeks. We asked the question also, how many of them thought they went into clinical remission? And again, this is from a patient perspective. This is not uh, with laboratory results, so it's uh, subjective. Uh, and you can see some people went on to the diet already in remission. Uh, and then by two months, 
a third of individuals went into clinical remission. And then uh, at 6 and 12 months, about 40% went into clinical remission. And I think this is, again, an important point. And I think somebody had asked, you know, what percentage of individuals do you think this diet really works in? And again, it's probably around 40 or 50%. Um, and we don't know why these individuals didn't go into remission. Was it because they didn't follow the diet strictly? Did they have the support they needed? Uh, so I think um, our clinical practice, if we really focus on it, could improve that number. Uh, but uh, this is what uh, we learn from uh, the outside world. So food for thought. Parents and children need to be born, uh, need to be on board with going on to the SED. So if the parent wants it, but the child does not, uh, then it's a no-go. Because remember, we are with our children just so many hours per day. Uh, and if they are not interested or not wanting to, um, they will, um, by accident, uh, get foods into uh, their system that they probably shouldn't. Changing one's lifestyle and diet is hard, and finding an STD community, um, I think, can make the difference for many, many families. And you're going to meet a number of phenomenal families today, um, and if you want to um, ask them about their community and become part of their community, I'm sure they would be happy to invite you in. Um, close follow-up with the healthcare provider and dietitian is so important. And again, this is not only uh, to make sure that our, the patient does well, but also to give positive reinfor uh, reinforcement and encouragement. Um, the strength of our words uh, is pretty significant. And if you go in to tell somebody, um, you know, you're doing a phenomenal job, you're amazing, which is true of all uh, the children we see, um, they will take that back home, and I think they will be stronger individuals for it. But most importantly, health and happiness of the patient and family is paramount. So if the diet itself is causing too much stress, uh, and Dr. Karen Cunningham is going to talk a little bit more about stress and IBD a little bit later today, um, then it isn't the right thing for that family. We want a therapy that works. Um, and that isn't um, burdensome for the family. Difficulties, uh, difficulties of the dietary therapy. Defining the diet. So even though there is a book, even though this has been done for a very long time, people define the SCD slightly differently. And we don't know if those differences are necessarily important or um, uh, or could compromise uh, how an individual does. I think that's why we need to do a lot more research in this area. The other difficulty is equating this diet with other non-medication therapies. Uh, I've had a number of families who have done um, SCD and juicing. And interestingly enough, none of the families actually do well. And I try to get them to stop the juicing, um, but I'm not sure if they do. Um, I've had families who have done uh, uh, whipworm. Uh, there was a question on whipworm. Um, and I feel that um, sometimes adding too many things into the pot uh, can um, make it more confusing. So what I tell families is that the SCD in and of itself should be the treatment that works. Uh, and if it doesn't, then we can consider other um, therapies. Uh, but I wouldn't add on extra alternative therapies um, uh, unless they have uh, truly been studied. Um, patient and family stress, as we talked about already. Weight gain and growth. Social issues. And this is important because eating is a very social activity. Uh, and you can see the individuals who are quite successful uh, in uh, the SCD. I'm waving to one of them. Uh, and, um, and they are able to adapt phenomenally well. Um, but sometimes people can't adapt. And so talking about this issue is uh, truly important. And some people complain a little bit of constant hunger. And so making sure there are enough food uh, 
for that individual is important, enough snacks, um, and um, uh, making sure that they're readily available. Alternatives to the SCD. So there are many people who are interested in dietary therapy, but they can't do it, and that's okay. Um, and when an individual is interested, um, there are other things one can do. I think that we have all seen that diet profoundly impacts an individual, not only in IBD, but in overall health, uh, as well as their fecal microbiome. What uh, I usually recommend is removal of processed foods from the diet as much as possible. Uh, and I sometimes talk about the FDA Modernization Act of 1997, which made it quite easy for food companies to add in additives without uh, a lot of study behind them. Avoiding eating out, primarily because of the issue with food additives. Um, low consumption of refined sugars and low consumption of milk. Um, and this is just based on uh, my reading of the literature. Uh, unfortunately, as of yet, there has not been a study um, proving this. Uh, other things one can do to make SCD easier is making sure there's a 504 plan for our patients, permission to uh, get uh, foods, uh, carry them, uh, and eat in class. A doctor's letter. So in the book that hopefully everybody picked up, there's a example doctor letter in there. And giving that to a family, a patient, can um, give them um, reassurance, give them ammunition if issue comes up. Again, um, carrying extra snacks and replacing those snacks often. So the future of dietary therapy. I'm going to steal another quote from Maimonides. Maimonides is quoted uh, as saying, no disease that can be treated by diet should be treated with any other means. And I think that's true. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who has IBD should go on to the SCD. But it means that if we can treat with dietary intervention, we should. Another quote, and I quoted myself, <laughs> uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. We really need to better define uh, dietary therapy. We need to better define who nutritional therapy is going to be useful for. We need to better understand the mechanism of action, and we need to better support our patients who wish to utilize nutritional therapy. So in summary, dietary intervention works, and we've seen that here at Seattle Children's. There is still much for us to learn. Dietary intervention fills a void that medication actually can't fill. Patient selection, when we talk about the SCD, is key. Patient support is mandatory. And close follow-up is important. Thank you very much. That's a great very, question. Very early onset IBD, I feel like I'm seeing more and more. You know, us too. I mean, there is no doubt we're seeing younger children, and and you just wonder why, um, and whether or not the microbiome of the mother is affecting the child or something of that nature. Um, the youngest we we've had uh, a number of children less than. Uh, a year on the SCD, um, and uh, I'll tell you two of my children, um, both of them uh, presented with blood in the stool. Um, both of them had uh, severe colitis on, uh, uh, on scope at, with granulomas, both of them, which was very interesting. Um, they both went on to EEN, and they both went into clinical remission. One individual, and, and then they both wanted to do SCD, and I supported that in both of them because in a baby, it's actually not that hard. Um, one family, the SCD worked phenomenally well, and that child is still on the SCD. Um, 
is the roundest, cutest baby you'd ever see. Uh, the other individual um, didn't respond to the SCD, uh, despite actually responding to EEN quite well and went on to methotrexate and is doing quite well. So, so we've done it in very young children uh, successfully, and sometimes it's easier because they don't have um, the preconception of what they're supposed to be eating and liking. Um, so yeah. Um, if the initial encounter and new diagnosis, you're discussing the options, uh, what's your typical counseling for, all right, we're going to do a dietary therapy, here's our endpoints, whether it be non-response or non-adherence, we're going to change, we're going to, we're going to start nutritional therapy, but if, if not at this point, we're going to go to the next step. I, I apologize. So, you, so what do I usually go to after nutritional therapy? What's your usual counseling? Is it, you know, give it two months, give it... Oh, uh, you know, it's, it's a great question, and it also really depends on how an individual is doing. So if they're floridly not responding and floridly having a lot of symptoms, I will change in, you know, two weeks or less than two weeks. Um, if they are clinically responding but have, you know, still mild elevation in inflammatory markers, um, you know, I will give it, you know, over three months. Uh, if they are clinically symptomatic um, and it's mild, uh, probably two months-ish. Um, and it doesn't mean that I go to an immunosuppressant. Sometimes I say, well, you know, you're doing really well. Let's, let's add on a mesalamine and see what that does. Actually, Dr. Damon wrote a phenomenal paper on um, the effect of mesalamines on the microbiome. Uh, and um, I think sometimes we don't completely know the mechanism of actions of the treatments, uh, but I try to keep it if somebody's doing okay uh, on the milder side, so sometimes I just stat, uh, add mesalamines. Can you just review again the relationship between allele disease and child protective level? Mm. You mean why, why it's abnormal, why, why you, um, uh, why it has a less of a sensitivity? I, I don't know why it has less of a sensitivity, but it's definitely um, been written about, uh, and I can, um, forward you the paper. So an isolated disease, you would be hesitant to rely on protective. No, not hesitant. I think I just, you know, as with all of IBD, you know, I put all the clinical, all the laboratory, all the knowledge that I have of what's going on into a bucket and then make up a plan from there. Uh, I think that I still use it, but I just remember that caveat. Have you ever Uh, so I have not used the Mediterranean diet. There is a study uh, that was just funded um, to compare the SCD to the Mediterranean diet in active Crohn's. So, so that question hopefully will be answered in the next few years. Has anyone studied whether SCD prevents other conditions? Or is there any prevention data for using SCD? This is <laughs> Yeah, no, no. And I wouldn't recommend it for an individual who doesn't have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, what I would say is, what I recommend is, literally for everybody, is the same thing, is try to stay away from the processed foods. I do feel like food additives haven't been studied well enough um, to know their complete effect uh, on the GI tract. And we know that IBD is on the rise, but we know that cancer is on the rise. We know that other autoimmune processes. Uh, and um, looking at probable causes, uh, I think diet is, is up there. Um, and again, staying away from uh, excess sugar and excess uh, milk. Um, uh, uh, endoscopy, endoscopy, part of the follow-up in a standard way, a uh, certain time, for example. And also, what is the definition that you're using for mucosal healing? Is it just a resolution of the ulcers and deletion, or is it actually biopsy? Is so, so, so from Borelli's study, it's actually the biopsy. It's, it's a histologic grade. Um, so do I. 
Um, repeat. So we do try and we do encourage repeat endoscopy and colonoscopy. It's not mandatory, and um, many families um, uh, don't move forward with that. Because that's coming up in the next yeah, talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so um, I will defer to okay. Kim. <laughs> Pro, there, there is a component of probiotics uh, to the SCD as well, um, and uh, most families will, will go on them. Do you recommend specific ones or whatever the family can? You know, it's a great question. So, so I, my general belief is the, the best uh, probiotic is the diet, which is actually a prebiotic, but, uh, but I really think you affect uh, the microbiome um, more strongly through that than any anything else. So, so there are some uh, you know that we would uh, give, uh, but but in general, if families have something that they feel is effective, I I go for that. Um, so this may be a little off topic, but I wonder if you've heard of any murmurings of SCD being used for other conditions, other autoimmune conditions like RA. I know Lane Godshell has kind of um, brought that idea forward. So, so um, we have a hospital who's very interested in dietary therapy right now. Uh, so our group here is looking at that um, as well. They're at the initial um, stages. Uh, there are reports um, of dietary therapies working for adult uh, RA, um, not specifically the specific carbohydrate diet per se. Um, we have actually had a number of individuals who have had joint significant joint complaints um, that the diet actually worked for the GI symptoms, but not as uh, significant for the, the joints. Um, we ourselves, you know, we have doing the SCD now for a number of years, so we sometimes get referrals from other divisions about using it uh, in other conditions. Um, and we haven't primarily dermatology, interestingly enough, uh, and we haven't had a significant change for those individuals, um, but those individuals, it was hard to know if they were truly compliant with the diet. Um, one of the things about IBD, I think, is because the symptoms are, can be so significant and severe, you're much more likely to be compliant, I think, with and it's GI, so it makes sense, food, GI. I think dermatology, it's um, maybe a, it's a harder thing to be compliant with. So. How close do you think we are to SCD being uh, widely held uh, in terms of the valid treatment well, I, you know, what I can say is there are definitely a number um, of people interested in the SCD. Um, and there's a lot of research, and what follows research is integration. Uh, we obviously have integrated it into our uh, program here. Uh, the actual title of our last paper was, I think it was called Integration of Dietary Therapy in an Academic Center. Um, because I think that's going to be very important, um, again, giving people more options and choices. Um, but everything in medicine is a little bit slower than we always want. And so my guess is somewhere between five and 10 years. So that's a guess. <laughs> yes. Other questions? Yes. Do you find that most or the majority of your patients, or what is the percentage of patients who would start on EEN and then switch to the SCD diet? or just go directly on to the specific carbohydrate diet? I'd like just to see if Yeah, I, I would imagine it's probably a split. It's, it's probably uh, a split. Um, obviously, those with UC usually just do the SCD. Um, probably 50-50. 
Okay, well, thank you very much.